Now, uh, before we get into Grasshopper, the uh, first step is to set uh, that image as a reference in Rhino. And um, the other thing is that we're going to set a surface size that's the same kind of aspect ratio of that image. And you can do the, the use the picture frame command for that. You, you might know how to use this already. So it's good for referencing uh, images and uh, when you need to make drawings and so on from, from images. So I'm going to type in picture frame. And I'm going to navigate to my file. And on my desktop, I have this image. I guess in my case, it's untitled one. You'll have, a, you'll have an image that you've downloaded um, that'll be titled accordingly. And you just click open. You can leave all these options by default up here, no problem. Uh, click in the bottom left corner, kind of like in my coordinate. Um, quadrant there in my quadrant of my, of my rhino space and I'm just going to kind of click away uh, somewhere over here so that I'm filling up most of that quadrant. Make it nice and large so that we can kind of spread out our pattern a little bit better. Okay, okay. so we're going to use this as a reference again and, and also the dimensions of this surface are, are going to be uh, perfectly aligned then with our pattern because we're actually drawing our pattern against that surface by subdividing that surface. Um, oops. Yeah, and let me reorganize my screen a little bit. Okay, fair enough. Uh, so what I want to do is this is a the picture frame command adds an image to a surface, so it's unlike a background um, image in that case, and that this thing can be actually manipulated like a surface can, right? Uh, and because of that, I can set it into Grasshopper. Uh, so I'm going to grab a surface parameter and I'm going to right click on it and set that surface. Okay, and uh, I'll we can keep that on for a little while, this background image, because we're going to use it to kind of reference to make sure stuff is, is going well. Uh, and then we can turn it off at some point and, and kind of go back and forth as we need to. Um, the, the next thing I want to do is make sure I right click on this and reparameterize it. Okay, so again, that, that are, so that my U and V values are, are somewhere between zero and one to, to accommodate the, the extents of the surface from, uh, from this side to the other. Uh, and and we'll, we'll talk about why a little bit later. Okay, um, so next thing is to subdivide it. So we'll go to Surface, Utility, ISO Trim. You might remember this one from earlier on, Workshop 1. We'll go to Math, Domain, all the way to the bottom, Divide Domain Squared, and do this. Okay, and we can turn off our original preview there and uh, see that, that now that we have uh, 100 surfaces coming out because we're breaking it down 10 by 10. Um, we, we need more density than that to develop a, a brick coursing. Uh, you know, one that's multi-portional. Um, but we're going to use these little panels to do it. So I'm going to double-click that and type in 50, you know. And I'm going to add some density in that direction. And then I'll copy and paste that. And I'll put in 70 here. All right. So if we zoom in now, I've got, you know, what's gets close to, at least visually, the kind of proportions of a brick. Um, you know, there are more precise ways to do this, to actually develop a, uh, let's say, a, a, a truly dimensioned brick pattern. But again, you know, as a sketch, like we've been doing in these workshops, as a sketch to test the, basically the workflow the, uh, of, of a, and, and different kinds of processes to make certain things happen, this is completely fine and you'll get the, you'll get the idea. Um, so now what I want to do is make the brick coursing, and, and we want that kind of stretcher bond pattern. So we we have just kind of blocks over the top of one another right now. Um, they're not staggered like most brick coursings are, and that's what we're going to do next. So I'm just going to take every other one of these lines, move them over a little bit um, in order to get my, my kind of half, half distance uh, overlap like you would see in most brick patterns, um, brick coursings. All right. So just follow along a little bit here. So what we're going to do is, first of all, have a look at what we got coming out. We've got just you know uh, 3,500 uh, surfaces that have no that have no real organization. So it's going to be by de you know with this set I said I can't select an entire row, for example, or entire column. Uh, so I need to make sure that I, s I subdivide this stuff into a new set of data that um, allows me to pick um, an entire row at once. So I'm going to go to Set List and Partition. Okay, so we're going to partition this list um, using one of these values as a way to set the size of those partitions. Let's make that 70. 
So we'll plug 70 in there and see what we get out. Yeah. So now I've got 50 lists of 70 items each, which would stand to reason, right? Because now we've got, so we've got, what that did is it isolated rows. And we can have a look here. Yeah. So now if I plug in uh, just this as a tester, I can see that um, if I change my index, I'll be able to just select one row at a time. Okay, so this, is, this data now has been kind of broken into the rows, um, which is good because I can run a call pattern on it to select every other row. And, you know, I guess it would be nice to hide that for a minute because I'm not, I don't really need it yet. So I'm going to select that surface and write it. I'll just type in hide and, you know, hide it for now. Uh, and then I'm going to go to sequence call pattern. This one you should remember from last term. And what we can do is we can right click on the P input, go to set multiple booleans, and we'll set this to true, false true, sorry. Okay. So that selected every other one as such. Yeah. And uh, now to really break this into two sets, I can copy and paste that, and then just right click on P and hit invert. Right. Uh, it'll turn off our original subsurfaces, and then we can click both of these to look at both options. Okay, bottom, top, so on. We'll, we'll deal with this first set for now because this is the one that I'm going to kind of push over. Uh, now, there's a couple ways to do that. I can push the whole thing, and then I can I can push all these over by a half distance of the size of this block, and then I can get rid of this last row. Or I could do something else, um, which might be a little bit easier which is to just kind of get rid of this first row here and then do a shift. Essentially the same process, just in reverse uh, order. Uh, but in order to do that, I need to first, because I've, I'm selecting col uh, rows here, I need to actually reconfigure that data into columns so that I could get rid of that first column. And I can use the flip matrix tool for that. Uh, and I, I found that in set and tree flip matrix. And then I'm going to use that little list component again just to show you what that did. So instead of, right, so instead of this, which is this first row here, I flipped it, the, the data structure, so that I get my first column here, okay? And, uh, and I can always flip it back later, which we probably end up doing at some point. Okay. And you don't need that, so you can delete it. Uh, the next thing is to go to set and my list tab, and I can shift my list over a little bit, right? So I can offset all those. And, and now I've done that, but um, first of all, it's a, a value of one that's good, but we want to make sure that we don't wrap our values because then we won't be getting rid of anything, okay? And you can see that here. I didn't actually remove that first row. So right-click W and set the Boolean to false. And now you can see that what I've done is gotten rid of that first row, okay? And that's good, so let's turn off these. Uh, and you can see that a little bit more clearly. Move that down a little bit. Okay. Now the only thing left to do to create our brick horsing is going to be to kind of move that set we just made and kind of move it backwards in space a little bit so that it sits directly over that seam, right? So the center point sits directly over that seam. But the thing is we don't know how far to go, right? Because we didn't really set a dimension of that block. So we got to measure a little bit, and then we'll uh, figure out what the dimension is. Okay, so we got to kind of use some of this data back in time here, this subdivided data. Um, so the first thing is to just select one block to operate on. I don't, need to s I don't need to measure all of them. I just need to measure one of them to get that spacing right. right? And uh, uh, um, in order to measure it, all I need to do is measure its outer edges. So after I've selected the first one using that set list item component, I can go to my surface tab up top and click this first component here, the VREP edges. That, and then what that's going to draw is the outer edges, right? The outer, the outer lines, and uh, I just need to um, select one of them, one of the long lines. So I'm going to use one of these list, list components one more time, and I'm going to have that selected. I'm going to zoom in, and you can see that when that's selected, luckily on my screen, the first one in the list here is the one of the longer lines. If that's not the case, just you know. Do one of these and you figure out which one is the long one in your list. Um, but by default, the first one, the zero index, is the long one. And that's the one I want because that's our length, right? Uh, in order to measure that, I can go to curve and curve length. I'm 
do that here. And now if I want to move all of these blocks back a little bit, I need to cut this value in half, right? Because that's going to move it a full length. I need to cut that into half. So what I can do is just right click over that L output, set an expression like this, x divided by 2. Okay. And that cut that value in half for us. And then all we need to do is move it, right? So I can double click in the middle there, grab a move uh, component. I can move this stuff. Here's my geometry. And then I could um, grab an X vector and right click uh, or double click again in there and just we're going to need to reverse that direction, right? Because by default, that's a positive X. This is a positive number. So we just reverse that. And you can see now the blocks have been moved uh, one half length to the negative x direction so that we've created essentially a brick person. Now, let's uh, type in show in Rhino. Oh, never mind that, that's an older one. Uh, let's type in show in Rhino and, and you'll see that there are no blocks now. There's no bricks that exceed the length of my original surface. Some of them are, are pulled back a little bit, but that's fine. But we don't go over it, and that's uh, just a kind of a workflow parameter that I set for myself here so that I wouldn't go over it. All right, so we can turn that back off again. Okay, so we've got a, a, a brick coursing, uh, but we have two separate, you know, you can see here, we have two, uh, because we broke it down to do to make that coursing, we've got two separate data sets, and we want to make that one set because it's going to make the rotation of all those blocks uh, much easier because then we can uh, we don't have to kind of operate on two sets. We just need to operate on one. So we're going to go to set, and we're going to merge, grab the merge component, and just merge these two together. It should be no problem. Um, delete that D3. We don't need that. Uh, and just kind of do this. We can turn off the originals. And we should now, when we select that, everything is kind of being selected. Um, but we want to make our data set a little bit more clear. You can see the kind of mess we made there. Uh, so just flatten it. It's pretty simple in this case because uh, this works in this case because um, it actually doesn't matter um, what order they're in so long as it's one set that we're dealing with for the next step. Okay. And the next step is to just find the center points of all of these surfaces. Um, and, and, and we're going to use that, that point matrix or that point array uh, to overlay on top of the image itself the black and white image, and we're going to use those points to extract a brightness value at that pixel, depending on if it's dark or what or light. If it's very light, it'll give us a high number. If it's very dark, it'll give us a low number, and so on. Or maybe it's the opposite. I, I don't quite remember, but you get the idea. Um, so we have surfaces. We can find a center point by going to surface and area like this. And uh, here I can start turning stuff off because now we've got points that we're dealing with. And, uh, um, you know, when we start the rotation and stuff, we'll, we'll be looking at an extrusion of it anyway. So let's uh, take it step by step. And now I don't have the right kind of information coming out of this. All I have right now is these x, y, z coordinates when I actually need uh, uv coordinates because they're going to be more related, you know, if you will, to the surface itself in terms of uh, where its location is. I need relative locations as opposed to x, y, you know, kind of global coordinates, okay? So let's turn that off. All right. Uh, so in my surface tab where I am already, I can go into here and grab my surface closest point. Point, of course, being all those center points, and now our surfaces are coming out of the merge component. You know, you won't see anything really new happening here, um, but we're basically just converting this point data so that we can get some more information out of it, which is going to be these uv, p values, okay? And uh, the next step is going to allow us to read our bitmap image or our, our, you know, our JPEG image, our raster image. And, um, and now it's time for that. We can start actually generating that data that we're going to use to rotate the blocks. All right, so we can go to parameters and image sample. Okay. And it's going to look like this by default. Um, so what you need to do now is uh, right click on this and um, go to settings. Okay, and that's going to open up this uh, dialog here. Uh, file path is going to be where your image exists on your computer. Okay, so wherever you put it. Hopefully it's on your desktop. It'll make it easier to find. 
uh, and you click this little button over to the right here and you can navigate over to it like this. And because we reparameterized our input before, we can leave this alone at 0 to 1, 0 to 1. That's good. And before we click out, we want to make sure that our channel here is set to color brightness. So it's the one all the way to the, uh, to the right, the black and white one. And it's a little easier to use, especially in this case, because we have a black and white image. Um, you can extract color out of color images and so on. Uh, we won't need that for this, for this exercise. And then um, hit OK. And now you'll see a kind of a representation of that that image in the and the grasshopper screen. All right, and then plug in your UVPs directly into that uh, that image, and you're going to get an output that's going to look something like this. So a bunch of values that are either high or low depending on where they exist along that image. Okay, so if it's really dark, it'll be really low. If it's really white, it'll be kind of it'll be higher, right? Somewhere between zero and one. All right. So that we have a start now in developing that data. Now, what we're going to apply that data to is um, bricks, right? And those bricks need some thickness. So uh, the next step now is going to be to extrude these original surfaces into blocks so that we can start rotating. Now, this can get a little bit slow, okay? So depending on the computer you're running, um, take this one a little slow and make sure that uh, you don't click around too much as it's thinking. Uh, we're going to, again, we're going to make a 35 or so, 100, yeah, 3,465, um, you know, B reps, right? So uh, solids, um, poly surfaces, if you will. And, 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 you know, that could get a little, a little heavy. Um, but we need to do it so that we could uh, model it properly. So we're going to surface and extrude. It's going to be under freeform. Right? And we're just going to extrude those surfaces back. And again, you're going to want to kind of go one step at a time here. Uh, so extrude those surfaces back. Uh, I'm going to go into my 3D view, my perspective view, I should say. Uh, I don't really need to see these points anymore, so I'm going to turn these off for a minute. And uh, I need to give this thing a direction to extrude this in. So uh, because we're drawing our, all our, oh, I forgot to mention earlier, I'm in the front view um, in my tutorial, right? So I, I've been working in the front view. Um, if you're in the, the top view, then you'll, you'll choose the uh, Z vector. Um, if you're in the front view like I am, you'll choose the Y vector, okay? So I'm going to double click in here, click Y. Um, and then before I set that, I'm going to grab a, a, a panel and just kind of set this to like 0 0.5, some kind of, uh, some size that's a bit smaller so that it might be proportionally brick-like, and then I'm going to plug that in, and I'm going to wait for a minute while my computer thinks, you know, and you can see, yeah, it took a second, and this is a pretty fast machine, so on your laptops, you might be uh, still waiting, and that's pretty normal, you know, uh, hopefully it didn't crash on you, I doubt it would, just let it think, and it'll be fine, yeah, and, you know, that's 0 0.5, again, it's a, it's a, uh, I'm in inches, you know, uh, so obviously, scalar-wise, this really doesn't really work, um, if you were to be modeling this in one-to-one, -one, you would be want you would probably want to uh, make sure that everything is set to the proper dimensions. But you know, again, as a sketch, I think you get the idea in terms of how to set um, the block. And for now, I'm visually, you know, I'm just visually putting these blocks together so I can sketch out a solution to our our little uh, facade rotation problem. Yeah. All right. So I have blocks. And uh, now uh, I'm going to head back into the front view because uh, that's the view that's going to matter, at least for these, these next steps. All right. OK, so remember, um, what we want to do is start rotating this stuff uh, using the data coming out of this, this image mapper. All right, so let's, let's start putting the pieces in place in order to do that. Okay, so the first thing uh, I'm going to grab is the rotate 3D command. So I'm going to go to translate, the transform tab, excuse me, uh, Eucl uh, Euclidean rotate 3D. Okay. And uh, when I'm rotating, uh, you, you could probably do a couple things here, but you know, we can make that a mesh. Uh, but yeah, what we're going to rotate is our, is our extrusions. Okay. And again, you know, let this, let the computer think for a minute. Uh, I'm going to turn off those those extrusions to go blank for a bit and um, just kind of deal with the geometry coming out of here first. Um, now, we have an angle to give it. 
this is going to be set in radians. And for this example, we're going to actually use radians. In, in workshop one, we used uh, degrees. Uh, I'm going to work with radians on this one, and I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you uh, why in a minute. The center of a rotation, um, now this is going to have to be the center of our block. Okay, So these, these original centers are not exactly what we want because they're at the front, basically, of those blocks. We want the, the, the center point of those blocks. Um, and to find that, we go back to surface, and we use volume this time. Okay, So we could find all those center points of those volumes. And I guess if we turn that back on for a minute, you'll see what I mean. If I go back into perspective view, yeah, you see all those points in there. Uh, it's kind of hard to see, but the points are, are floating uh, in the volume there. Okay. Ignore this stuff back here. That's just my silly rotation that I'm going to end up updating in just a second. So I'm going to head over back in the front view, and that'll be our, that's just going to go directly into our, our C input here. Oops, make sure you're uh, you're not putting the, the V out. The, the C output is actually the centroid itself, so it's the point. So we can update that. All right. And now we've got a rotation of our bricks, which is 90 degrees, based on the radians that are set in here, which we're going to update in just a second. Now our axis for all of this is the Z axis, because I'm kind of, again, I'm in the front view. Um, and my, my rotation axis is my z-axis, so I'm going to just double-click in and drop in a z-vector. I'm going to place that z-vector relative to all the centroids, and I'm going to put that in my axis input here, like so. Nothing will really change. Uh, it's just a good thing to do so that you're not rotating the entire set of blocks. Um, and, you know, as a test, why don't you go ahead and just plug in the the values coming out of the image mapper into your angle input and see what happens. Yeah. Uh, you know, something is going to start happening, right? You're starting to see a little bit of shade shadow action going on. It's not a lot of rotation, you know, um, but we're getting there. Now, the one thing is, too, I think the gray background is not really serving us very well in terms of feedback, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go to my options in Rhino, uh, turn my grid off for this one. And then I'm going to go to Appearance, Color, and change my background to white. Okay. And, and this might be helpful, so I can start to, I don't know, I can see a little bit better what's going on. And the other thing is uh, I'm going to get rid of those center points. And there we go. So you can start to see the pattern emerging, right? There's a relationship between the image and the rotations in the blocks. Uh, if I head over into my perspective view, and if I kind of zoom around a little bit like this, you'll start to see that it's starting to work. Okay, it's pretty nice. And if I kind of look upward at it like so, um, yeah, you can start to, to see the, the rotations going on. Now, with all this transparency and stuff, it's a little bit complex, the image, but uh, you get the idea. Um, and and why, don't we, uh, why don't we have a little fun testing this? Uh, before we start manipulating our data a little bit, let's have a little fun testing this. Let's 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 get away from this red uh, default uh, color, kind of, and let's go to display preview, custom preview, right? And let's give this thing a, I don't know something that's a little easier to look at. Probably not that pink color. Uh, so let's go to parameters, input, color swatch, and uh, I'm going to drop in this this color here, but that. That's kind of interesting in a way. Uh, we'll, we'll check back on that later. But I'm going to give it a kind of a bluish tone just because I, I like the way that looks. And I'm going to drop the drop its alpha value a little bit as well. Um, sometimes that helps too. See what that looks like. Yeah. And then uh, while I'm in my front view, I'm going to try something out and see if I can get a good look at how this is starting to work here. Uh, while I'm in the front view, I'm going to type in turntable. So turntable. And uh, I'm just going to kind of speed this up a little bit. And zoom in just a slightly. Right? And I'm just going to rotate this around to see kind of where the bricks are aligned with my point of view. Now here I'm kind of getting reflection. Now I'm getting opacity. Right Now I can see through some visual porosity. 
reflection. Reflection all from this side. Very little visual porosity because of the rotation angles. And then I get a little bit more coming back. Okay. So this is going to be a nice way to get, gain some feedback on how our pattern is working for us. Um, and if you're happy, you, you know, it's really just a matter now of kind of tweaking. And I'm going to turn that, turn that off. And then um, to reset that view, I'm just going to go back to set view front. And that will kind of set my elevation view again. So as the turntable will kind of goof up your view a bit. Okay. Um, it was actually kind of cool, though. I want to try this. I haven't tried this yet, but I want to try that white color just to give it a, just to make it white so it blends in with the background of the rhino world. And let's just look at what this does, just in terms of shadow. This is actually kind of a neat way of, of analyzing this. Yeah. So now we're only seeing the shadow play. And of course, it disappears entirely. Oh, now it comes starting to come back around. Pretty nice. Oops, looks like I goofed up my view there, but I guess it's still still kind of cool to see in that view as well. Okay. So the other thing is that all of my rotations are kind of along one. They're one-sided rotations, right? I'm only getting kind of visual access in through one view. And I want to I want to do something a little bit more than that. So I want to give this thing the ability to rotate even further. And I want to be able to control it a little bit more. Um, well, I guess I'll leave that on. I guess it's OK. All right, so the next step now is going to be to just, you know, um, in between in between this data and, and what we've already done, we're going to add a little bit more control over these numeric values so that I can kind of test this even. Uh, uh, I can get a range of options that I can explore as being the right or the wrong option. Okay, so this, it, this is why we're using radians because it's a little bit easier, to done, uh, easier done in radians. And, you know, I'm going to go back to this for a second, give this thing a, just a different color for now because it's actually a little bit hard to work with when I can't see everything. Uh, I guess I'll just do that. I guess it's fine. Okay. Okay, one thing we can try is to reverse reverse this setup, right? So here where it was the lightest, you get the most rotation, and where it's darkest, you get no rotation. You can reverse that pretty simply by kind of remapping our values. Um, and I'll show you that because we're going to use this anyway as a way to kind of test our, our rotations. So we're gonna first we're going to remap it just to invert them to see what they look like. So I'm going to... Uh, take the values coming out of the image mapper and put it into my remap. Uh, by the way, I found that in maths domain remap. Okay, so Went a little bit fast through that. My source domain is 0 and 1. I know that to be true because of that's what we set you know, in the image mapper. And now I just need to give this thing a new target domain. All right. Um, now I'm going to go to domain again and go to construct. This is uh, um, by default 0 and 1 once again. Um, but I can also, I can change that to uh, 1 to 0 if I like. I can just reverse it. So I'm going to grab a panel. And because domains do not have to be uh, in any kind of order from small to large, or they can really be however you like, negative, positive, or whatever. Uh, so I can reverse this domain now to this. And I can, now that I've remapped these values, I can just pop these into my, my rotation. And it's going to take a second to update. There we go. Okay, so now we've got a um, the opposite thing happening, where we're getting rotation, you know, going on uh, where it's darkest, and no rotation where it's lightest. Okay, so this is a really just a judgment call. It's a choice, and I think I'll stick with that um, for now. And the next thing now is what I want to do is uh, I want to be able to show a range of options um, that's not. <coughs> that I don't have to change my, my image to do, right? So I can, I could probably, you know, um, change my image and I would get a different pattern. But I can also work within this pattern to just change the rotations, right? In order to get some more porosity out of this at different views. And, and let's, let's go over a process for that. So you just follow along a little bit here because I'm gonna start with, first of all, a, a new component probably to you, which is the sets concatenate. So I'm gonna go to sets text 
concatenate. And, and the reason for this is that I'm going to uh, build a kind of a custom uh, domain that I can use to, to remap to. All right, and I'm going to add a, a C input to that by zooming in and hitting the plus sign. Um, I'm going to grab a panel, and I'm going to write in 0, 2, like this. And you could put a space after that. Okay, so zero space, two space, all right? Plug that into A. Uh, the B input now is going to be a slider uh, between uh, zero and two because two pi is the, is the rotation angle for, it's, it's a full rotation in radians. So a half rotation is pi, uh, full rotation is two pi. So I'm gonna give myself a range here between, you know, um, by, by setting either no rotation or ultimate rotation, which is going to be a value of 2. Okay, so that's between 0 and 2. And uh, by default, I'll just kind of leave this at 0 0.75 for now because I, uh, I think that'll be a good test. And I'll copy and paste that panel, and I'm going to wrap this thing up by saying times pi. Okay, no spaces or anything, just kind of asterisk pi, pi. And I'm going to pop that into C. All right, now have a look at what this created for us. This created a, a direction. It created basically a, uh, not a set of directions, but it's created a domain, right? So domains coming out of this component are organized in the same way. They're formatted like this. So one, two, zero. In this case, I've got zero to 0 0.75 pi, but if I update this slider, I can be updating my domain, okay? And um, so this is nice. So what we can now do is uh, do a little swapping out a little bit here. Um, I, can, I can go back to math, and what I'm going to do is deconstruct this domain to find a start and end point. And um, using uh, uh, this component, we can get rid of our 0 and 1, and I'm just going to, oops, it's updating. There we go. And I went back to how we had it before. So what I'm going to do, and the reason is, is because I've got kind of a, a I'm giving myself the option to reverse this again because I'm going from small to large again. But if I want to go from large to small and back again, all I got to do is kind of swap these inputs and outputs. So in this case, I'm going to go from large to small just by taking, deconstructing it and kind of putting that into my input and this into my output. Uh, and again, your computer is probably going to need a second to, to wake up a little bit once it starts this process. So it's kind of be patient. All right, so let it think. Um, It'll go like that. Uh, okay, so my computer updated. It's it's now showing me the result of this new of this new domain here. Now, if I change this, you can imagine it's going to take a while to update again, right? The reason is that I'm dealing with surfaces, and it takes a while to rotate and preview surfaces. Um, they're just heavy as geometries. Um, but I think I could speed this up and probably your computer a little bit by um, converting these surfaces that are coming out of here into meshes and then using that as my preview geometry. So I'm going to go to the Mesh tab, go to my Utilities uh, box over to the right, and grab Simple Mesh. Okay, and I'm going to run these through here like that, turn off that preview, and swap out that previewer like so. Um, now, it's interesting what happened. Um, I'm not getting that nice reflection that I was getting before in the Rhino, uh, and that might just be because it's a... Yeah, I guess it's just because it's a, uh, a mesh and not a surface. It's going to kind of represent differently, uh, unfortunately. But that's okay because I guess what we really want to do here is just kind of determine where the porosity is, right, at what viewpoint. And now because I've kind of set a rotation angle, now this should, this should speed up a little bit. Yeah, it's a little faster. Okay. And I can kind of play with this a little bit. Um, and check my what kind of different patterns that come out of this. You know, uh, 0 0.5 is going to give us pretty close to uh, what we had before, right? It's going to kind of make all these rotate in the center. Um, but as I continually rotate these things, they're going to start forming more a more complex pattern. And now they're going to be now they're going to be kind of in uh, and you'll see this when we go to the preview and the perspective view, how this has changed a little bit. But first, I'm going to run that turntable again, okay? And we'll kind of analyze it that way.
too fast. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, so depending on your point of view, you get either kind of a full bar of visual access through the center, and as it kind of, you walk away, you get a, kind of a line of visual access that kind of separates out from center out, right? So in from the center, and then out from the center, as you can see. And I think we can probably dynamically update this parameter as this thing is turning around. So if I put in two into this, you can see what happened. Now I'm developing a lot more pattern, a lot more interferences in that brick pattern, a lot more depth to it in different areas, much more rippled. Okay. And you know, maybe this is what you're looking for, maybe it's not, maybe it's too aggressive, um, but at least we have the ability to go and change it. That's not enough from that view. It starts to reveal itself a little bit more slowly. So you go from subtle, subtle things to more aggressive things as you uh, change the rotation angle and your range of rotation angles, I should say. All right, let's turn that down. Let's go and set this front view again, all right? And I'm gonna jump into my uh, perspective view for a second and have a look at this thing up in this direction because it's hard to visualize otherwise. But yeah, you can see it now. Right, you can see they kind of the fanning action that's going on. So they fan out pretty deep here. You know, here they start pretty much flat, but this is pretty beautiful, right? So it, it fans, you know, uh, I guess clockwise in this direction and then counterclockwise in that direction. Um, and uh, you can see if you follow it up more uh, vertically, also what's going on. It's kind of a twist, right? So it twists up in space a little bit and back again. So you're getting, you know, it's pretty nice, I think, overall three-dimensionality, kind of a ripple to this surface. And if you zoom around again, you'll, you'll find all the different kind of visual uh, and optical effects that come out of this. Like so. Okay, so we've got good, pretty good control over this, I'd say. Um, and I'm going to leave it at 0 0.75. I think I, I kind of like the way that looks. And the last thing I want to do is I want to, um, and this is something that I did also in the the other tutorial for the De Young Museum, and it was probably a little more useful for that one because in that one we we broke down all the circle pattern, the punch pattern, into a distinct set of eight sets of po of, of holes that I could use to uh, determine which holes get a particular diameter so that I can kind of output that to a fabrication machine and be highly efficient with how that happens. So you select a diameter size um, and you try to break it down you know, into an, uh, uh, enough sets that you get a high enough resolution to accommodate the pattern. Here I want to do something similar just to show you how you would do something like that in case you don't look at the other tutorial. Uh, and what we're going to do is kind of just organize, reorganize these bricks by uh, a range, a, a smaller range of a rotation angle. Um, why you might do something like this? Well, it could be good to know, depending on who's building it and how it's being built. I mean, the original here was built with robots, so it probably doesn't matter um, in terms of you know um, what the angles actually are. But sometimes in certain projects, it's good to be able to analyze at least, uh, um, uh, be able to break apart your 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 assembly into parts that could be organized into kind of processes, right? So. Uh, maybe it matters that some of the bricks are rotated more than others, and you need to kind of identify which ones they are so that, um, uh, let's say, the robot arm can't reach that angle. You would have to kind of do something so that, uh, you know, uh, you'd have to make a change uh, to the process so that you can accommodate that angle rotation and so on. Anyway, so that what we're going to do is uh, just kind of walk through a workflow that allows you to break down, you know, this kind of array of things into something that's... Uh, um, you know, a kind of a discrete analysis, I guess. And we're going to kind of apply a different color to each one of them randomly. Um, and, uh, and then we can kind of get a different kind of visualization of this based on the kind of ranges of, of rotations that we've got coming out here. Okay. All right. So the, the thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to use the data first in order to do that because these are our rotation angles in radians. 
Uh, we can always convert this later to degrees and then you can kind of put it in more plain language. Uh, but for now, we're going to work with these. Uh, so the first thing we got to do is figure out what our, our boundary is, our bounds of that domain. So we go to maths, the min max bounds component here up at the top um, that we've used a couple times, I think, before. And uh, the next one then in, compar in conjunction with this is going to be our divide domain component. Okay, so we're going to divide that domain into a set of, uh, I think they call them segments here, right? By default, it's 10. I'm going to make it 8, um, just so I can put a custom value in. And now uh, my output here, so this used to be this, so 0 to 2.3 something, and now I've broken that down into 8 chunks, basically, within, that, within those bounds, right? So here's our low, here's our high. And we've broken it into kind of eight evenly divided, if you will, chunks. And, uh, and I'm going to use this as a way to kind of at least determine, uh, you know, at what point, at what bricks fall within this rotation angle, what bricks fall within that range of rotations, what bricks fall within this range of rotations. Okay. As a way to further analyze this, this thing that we've drawn. So the next thing is to go over and into maths again and grab the includes component. Um, and this one is going to s uh, test uh, as a Boolean value uh, which values fall within which domain. Okay, so these are original values. Um, and in order for us to keep all of these domains separate from one another, we want to graph them, right? So we want to graph that input so that I'm essentially uh, duplicating this input eight times in order to find a true-false breakdown, a uh, true-false pattern within each of these. So if the value fits within this, it'll throw a true. If it does not fit within that range, it'll throw a false in that list. Okay, so we can go ahead and plug these in here. And um, what this is going to output is a whole bunch of true falses. Okay, uh, a certain number of times so that you can kind of use this as a way to mask and call out uh, particular sets of bricks relative to this data. So that's the last step, and that's going to be just to s uh, grab. S uh, the call pattern component from sets. The uh, stuff that we're going to be calling actually is our meshes. All right, and we can turn this preview off for a second because we're going to actually end up updating this with new colors. And I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. Um, and our data is going to be this. So this is our pattern. Now it's going to look like what we had before. Okay, and that's good. We didn't lose anything. But what we can't see yet because we haven't visualized it is that this is now broken down into eight eight chunks, right? Eight different sets that are kind of nested and stacked on top of one another. Uh, so in order to visualize that, I'm going to walk you through a process to apply and assign a random color value to each one of those sets, okay? Um, as opposed to setting it manually. I mean, you could set eight, eight different colors and you can be happy with that if you'd like. Um, but I kind of like to work this way because, you know, I find it to be a little bit faster. Now I'll show you what I mean. So again, I got eight kind of sets coming out of this. I want a separate color for each one. All right. Okay. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do then is I'm going to go to the, the sets tab, and under sequence, I'm going to grab a series uh, to start developing the, the my RGB values for each one of those sets, as I talked about earlier here. And I know I need eight values to start with because I have eight sets. Okay, so I can reuse this this input or I could copy and paste it, it's your call. Uh, I'm also going to input a, a value into the n, the n input there. And uh, we're going to change this, and this is going to be something that we can use to change our colors. Uh, but for now, we'll leave it at 6. And you can see I have uh, 8 values coming out that are 6, uni uh, six units, I, I suppose, apart from one another. Um, what we need to do is get rid of that little 0 at the end. For good practice, we can just run that through a integer. and um, and we're going to now just get rid of the decimal point. And in order to uh, make sure that these are actually set to, um, to separate lists, uh, we're going to create a separate list by grafting that, that data set. Okay. So before it was a single list of eight items, and now we've got eight lists of one item each, which uh, is a good start. Now, in order to randomize this, this color uh, field, I'm going to grab, uh, go to sets tab sequence and grab that random component. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and plug that into our our seed. Um, now, 
depending on how many values you want to come out of this, uh, if, you, if, you're gonna, uh, if you want a completely random set of colors, you're going to need three values at least for an RGB uh, set of colors because you're going to need a random number for R, a random number for G, and then a random number for, for B. So we can do that. So we can uh, grab another panel, type in 3, and input that into N. And um, that's going to give us three random values based on the range that we gave it uh, into the R input here. So now we're getting three random values between 0 and 1 because that is our default setting. We, we don't want that um, because uh, these aren't going to be good enough to set an actual color value into an RGB uh, previewer. So what we want to do is change the, the max of this the numeric range to 255 to fit, um, to fit the range of, of RGB colors. And now what we've done is we've started to develop a set of RGB values that we can break down into three different pieces, separate them by commas, and pass them in to the previewer. But we've got to make them integers again. And, and you know, the random component, that's, well, I guess we can right click on that and make them integers so we don't have to do that part. So you can just right click on the random component, engage this uh, little integer uh, option here, and uh, it's going to output better better information for us for this next step. Okay, and what I said before, we're going to separate each one of those lists. So I'm going to use one of those list item components, zoom in, and you know, give myself three outputs. Take the first number, second number, and third number. All right, so that's zero, one, two, three, nothing like that. And uh, the last thing then is to put all this back together into something that could be read by that component, which is basically just these three numbers uh, separated by commas because that's how RGB values are described on the computer. So we're going to go to sets, text, and cat name. All right. I'll zoom in on that and add a C input. And I'm going to just go ahead and drop in uh, I into A. Uh, you know what? I need to add more inputs. Sorry. Uh, you got to open this all the way up to at least to, uh, to E. Um, but because we have I'm also going to add one more, actually, now that I'm thinking about this on the fly here. I'm going to add a G because um, I'm going to set an alpha value, so a kind of a transparency to this. Um, I'm going to also go to parameters, grab another panel here, and I'm going to just type a comma in. No space, no nothing else, just a comma. And the comma is going to go into B, B, and F, right? Because this is going to be the, the thing that separates the rest of these values. Um, and then the last thing is going to be to just kind of set an alpha value before I start plugging stuff in, and I'm going to set that to 100. And the last value in any RGB list is the alpha. And now 1 can go into C, and the output of 2 can go into E. And let's just make sure I've got something that's working here. Yeah. So these are going to be, this is the right kind of data now that can be used to describe a color on the computer, and that's what we're going to uh, pass now into our previewer. And we could turn that previewer on, and um, we need to turn off our, our uh, original meshes, um, and we also have to, I guess, swap out those meshes for the called meshes, right? These are the ones that we actually reorganized, if you remember. These are unorganized, and these were reorganized based on the, the sequential domains. And now, um, if you look at the screen, you can see that we've basically set a custom color to each one of those bricks that fall within this, the particular ranges that we found over here. Uh, this is looking a little ugly, so I'm going to change the seed number, see if we can get something else to come out of it. Yeah, it's looking pretty rough. This one's not so bad. But you don't really have a lot of control over this. I mean, really all you can do with this random component is to, first of all, I'll put how many numbers you want, which in this case is three. Uh, but really it's all about the seed value and changing that until you find something that you think is a little more reasonable. Uh, the other thing you can do is, I guess, kind of limit the range that you're, put, yeah, you're uh, putting out. Um, but that's not really going to, I guess, change the hue too much. Um, but yeah, so this is a, a just general idea for how you can at least now start uh, forming a visualization that, that organizes these bricks into their rotation kind of ranges, right? So the lowest range in the middle, or maybe that's the highest range. 
Oh, no, no, yeah, that's one of the lower ranges, and the higher ranges are these purple values in here, or the purple bricks in here, right? So it's good to be able to at least identify which ones are rotated to, to, a, to a more particular uh, range, so between here and here and so on. Um, and let's see, I'm just going to kind of experiment to see if we can improve upon the color here. I'm going to output two values instead, and then I'm going to set 255 into my B input here swap that out yeah at least at least now see if you can if you give it at least a, a steady if, if one of the RG or B values is steady you'll end up with a kind of a little bit more of a complementary range and and that's what you're seeing here so I think this is a little nicer 16 turns out to be a pretty good one okay and then you can go back to the turntable if you like and rotate that around uh, again to kind of visualize it even further You can see the opacity merging in there, so it's going to let light in from these particular angles and points of view. So now, as you do something like this, you could be comparing your rotation angles to actually a point of view and how much light lets in. Right, so this one's rotating, and you're getting so the purples are, are you know you're letting light in in a certain angle of viewing and so on. Okay, so that's it for this one. Uh, we'll see you next time.